Dear Mr. President, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we Europeans, we have a problem with the European Union. We often do not find a middle ground. And I think that Brexit is a good example for this. The question is, how do we actually speak about the European Union? Basically, I think we have two versions. Either, if you will, the European Union is seen as the magic bullet, solving all our imminent problems, and hence we should finally, basically, bring it to full fruition. Or alternatively, the European Union is seen as the worst thing possible, a bureaucratic and undemocratic juggernaut destabilizing our countries culturally, politically, and economically. Similarly, we often wonder about the European Union's future, for which there's also two very different, fundamentally different versions. Is it on the verge of collapse, or is it weathering the storm rather well? And if you will, Street answers Banks' 2017 new rule, which many of you will have seen, can be read in either way. Either, again, as an image of the European Union in lethal crisis, just about to be torn down. Or again, you could also read it as the story of a lonely man on a wobbly ladder who might destroy the star while leaving little mark on the wall behind it. And this is one reason why I also think that Banksy's work is such a pointed comment on our times. We Europeans, and many others, I should add, have problems finding a middle ground with regard to the European Union. A union that often looks also like a land without a past. Who is actually able to name three or four of its major turning points in its history? Where and how actually do we teach its history in a way that is both scholarly and rigorous, as well as also exciting, which obviously very difficult with this topic that is at hand here. While we have problems finding a middle ground and a balanced view, even if this probably today is needed more than ever. And for such a view, I think a critical analysis of the past is indispensable, a past which I want to introduce to and discuss with you further today. So I would like to invite you to look at the history of European Union with fresh eyes and to think about the lessons that this past actually holds for us today. I would like to exemplify this by probably discussing the most obvious example, the question of whether European integration contributed to peace. Now, if you look up the website of the European Commission's representation in Germany, there is a very succinct and clear answer to that question, and I quote, for 70 years, the European Union has been guaranteeing peace. And not very surprisingly, I should add, if you look up the Commission's website in the United Kingdom, you don't find that same sentence there. And one could add that others are obviously even more critical. Brexiteers, such as Boris Johnson, argue that the European Union did not contribute to peace at all, that only NATO played such a role at the international level. Today, I would like to offer you a short, a very short historical analysis, which offers a different kind of view. Taking it from there, I would like to draw somewhat general lessons from this history of European Union for where we stand today and looking a bit further into the future. So then let's start by asking to what extent did the European Union's predecessors contribute to creating and to guaranteeing peace? A question that seems obvious, even more so, if we would think about how, much, how long this union has been around, but I think that the answers to these questions tend to be surprisingly new, particularly if we do not just look at the motives, but also of the effects of political programs over these decades. Now, if we start with motives, then of course it is clear that peace was indeed a central reason why many post-war politicians and citizens aimed to create something like European Union. On May 9, 1950, French Foreign Minister Robert Schumann proposed the founding of a European community of coal and steel. In many ways, one could argue the first step to what led to the European Union that we have today. On that day, he argued that such a community would ensure that, and I quote, any war between France and Germany becomes not only unthinkable, but also materially impossible. As such, Schumann tied cooperation in this sector, obviously so central for modern warfare, directly to questions of peace. And Schumann, I should add, really knew what he was talking about. He had been born in 1886, having his father's then German nationality. 
During World War I, Schumann worked in the German administration. One World War later, in World War II, he was then joining the French Resistance. He knew really from his own experience, from his own life, about the fragility of peace. And the idea of overcoming Europe's bloody past therefore clearly drove his own policies. Having said that, peace was never the only motive for European integration. To stick to this level of mo the motives for just one other moment. And the Schumann Declaration, which I started to talk about, um, supplies a good example for that. The French government only resorted to the proposal after all other initiatives to contain Germany politically had failed and plans for close cooperation with the United Kingdom had also been derailed. Economic interests frequently mingled with geostrategic considerations. Schumann certainly was interested in preventing war, above all, another war with Germany. But integration also represented an attractive and innovative instrument for securing French predominance in Western Europe in this new emerging post-war order. National interests also, I want to add, shaped the motives of others in this founding generation of politicians, such as Paul Ries Bach, Konrad Adenauer, or Alcide de Gasperi. But more importantly, public discourse and also the research so far have mostly focused on motives and not really on the effects of policies. Though ultimately, I think the effects should really concern us at least as much or even more. Now, this European coal and steel community of 1952 resulting from the Schumann Declaration had, and that is often overlooked, a very mixed record when it comes to securing peace. It became dysfunctional in important respects within just a few years. And more importantly, the predecessors of today's European Union emerged too late to contribute to peace through any real influence on the shape of the post-war political order in Europe. The decisive actors in that process were the nation states. And at the international level, a long series of negotiations and treaties also that had begun already while the Second World War was still in progress. This international arrangement already was consolidating by the time that the predecessors of today's European Union emerged onto the scene with again the European Coal and Steel Community of 1951 and then the Treaties of Rome of 1957, i.e. those organizations that were the starting ground for what were then becoming the European Communities and today's European Union. The European Union was not only established too late to create peace in post-war Europe. In the era of the Cold War, it even deepened uh, the confrontation between East and West. When, for instance, the treaties of Rome were concluded in 1957, the Soviet foreign ministry stressed that this would lead to, and I quote, the further deepening of the division of Europe and heightening the tensions within Europe. And the Czechoslovak caricature here from the same year saw things very similarly. Even if one takes the Cold War as a given and asks then if the EU's predecessors strengthened the Western camp vis-a-vis -vis the East, the result, I argue, is mixed. The EU is only one international organization in Western Europe in the beginning amongst many. One of the others was the European Free Trade Association, sometimes also known as EFTA. Founded in 1960 explicitly as a rival economic and above all trade formation, it brought together most of those Western European countries that did not join the EC. Western Europe thus split into two camps and found itself unable to address the Eastern Bloc with a single voice. This applied to the first place to the economic realm, but it also had security implications. In 1955, when the division of Western Europe was already starting to become apparent, Washington therefore pressed for unity. Secretary of State John F. Dulles appealed to London as the prime mover behind the EFTA project because Washington wished to avoid fragmentation, he said, and he hoped, and I quote from him again there, that we can count upon your government's support. However, the cajoling went largely unheeded. To summarize, during the first two decades, the EU's role in creating or also guaranteeing peace was rather low. It profited more from the brutal, the fragile peace of the early Cold War than it really contributed to it practically. 
But this obviously is not the full story. The political leaders of post-war Western Europe never put all their eggs into one basket. Under the benevolent Germany of the United States, they created a whole host of international organizations and security systems. If you will, they created several Europes at the same time. Among these, the EC initially did not stand out. NATO, for instance, was more important with regards to security concerns. The Council of Europe took care of human rights issues, but also, for instance, of educational and cultural policies. The EC had a strong focus on economic matters, but so did, for instance, the OECD and other less organi known organizations like the UNECE. So it is, one could argue, very easy to get confused in this alphabet soup of organizations, indeed, post-war Western European cooperation became a maze of partly overlapping, partly competing organizations, along with bilateral agreements, so it is quite easy to lose track of what was going on then. Against the backdrop, the EC was not the alternative to nation-centered forms of policymaking, but I would think a rather fragile latecomer in an already densely populated field of international organizations. This system was complex, but it also had clear advantages despite its overlaps and rivalries. It allowed political elites to see which of these organizations did particularly well. Moreover, there was another positive effect. Conflicts between member states were often restricted to just one of these forums and thus contained. When, for instance, French President Charles de Gaulle paralyzed the EC for six months in 1965, with the so-called crisis of the empty chair, which is just one of the many crises of that organization, France still continued to feel, fulfill all its obligations in the Council of Europe, the OECD, and elsewhere. The multiplicity of organizations therefore gave rise to a certain division of labor and an informal balance that over time proved to be remarkably robust. But from there, let's return to the question of peace. I now also need to qualify my early argument that, again, the early EC did not contribute much to creating peace, and I need to do this in four ways. Firstly, the EC did stabilize, again, not produce, but stabilize peace since the 1960s within the European communities by creating what I would want to call a culture of compromise and cooperation, and that was very important because this was fundamentally different, this new establishment of trust between elites in the community, different to the nationalistic and self-centered polities that had characterized politics in interwar Europe. Former Wehrmacht officers, resistance fighters, collaborators were now working side by side, trying to solve the economic and social problems of their time. Let's take, for instance, this picture taken in 1964 of the first EC Commission as an example. You see here the commission's first president, Walter Hallstein, a German Christian Democrat and a former Wehrmacht officer. The man in the front, bald head man, who smiles charming, I think, is the Dutch socialist Siko Mansolt, who joined the resistance against Nazism during the war. The man in the background, who also you see there highlighted, is Lambert Schaus from Luxembourg, a civil servant during the war, who then became a slave laborer in Nazi Germany. Now imagine these paths and imagine that 20 years later all these men were sitting around a table trying to build a new, a peaceful Europe. Such encounters, I should say, also happened in other international organizations and at the bilateral level, but nowhere, I would want to argue, did they become as intense as in the EC. Secondly, there was the EC's symbolic role and that clearly mattered. The European community claimed a very special aura as the, as the European solution for the most important questions of the age. Even the most trivial technical details, such as setting export duties for wheat, for instance, were celebrated as manifestations of peace-building cooperative efforts. For example, in 1963, the French philosopher Raymond Aron lauded one such minor success as la victoire de l'idée européenne, the victory of the European idea. Now, he was not very much interested in market and trade issues. Instead, he saw that agreement in Brussels as one small step to build the Grand Europe. The EC thus became a symbol 
of Western Europe's political rebirth. It was a specific project, but one directed towards a much larger reality, and this gave it huge amounts of symbolic as well as political importance. The third and fourth reasons have to do much more with the second half of the Cold War, with the 1970s and 80s. Thirdly, the EC massively contributed to what I would like to call social peace, which obviously, again, is a very different form of peace to the one I was referring so far to so far. This was mostly the social peace dimension because of its common agriculture policy, the CAP. Most people associate the CAP with useless surplus production and high prices, and that, I should say, is sadly true. But I do think that there was also a positive side that is much less well known. The CAP also in helped to ensure the historic transformation of the primary sector in that it's basically progressed largely free of conflicts in the second half of the 20th century, whereas in the first half of the century, it had led to enormous political destabilization. On paper, the CAP pursued a whole spectrum of objectives, especially increasing production. In reality, however, it served primarily as a hidden form of social policy, introducing political measures to cushion the dramatic shrinking of the agricultural workforce in continental Western Europe. The CAP thus helped to stabilize Western European societies and to produce a certain form of social peace, and similar things can also be said about other programs, for instance, the EC's regional policy. Fourthly and finally, the EC stabilized the interior of its member states and secured post-social peace also in another way, although it should be noted that this interior was now very different from the early days. What I'm referring to here is the three new states that joined the EC during the final decade of the Cold War after a period of already closer relations since the mid to late 1970s. Greece, Spain, Portugal were all emerging from periods of political turmoil. When they applied for EC membership in the mid or late 70s, they were all young democracy recently and newly emerging from right-wing dictatorship and authoritarian rules. In terms of peace and security, accession to the EC helped them to stabilize their societies, both external as well as internal. And this experience then proved to be crucial when the Iron Curtain crumbled and fell. At the end of the 1980s, the EC became one of the key forums to create a peaceful post-Cold War Europe. In 1990, it integrated the former GDR as part of unified Germany into the community without a prior accession process or special reservations. German unification thus went hand in hand with the community for the first time expanding outside the Western Europe of the Cold War. Above and beyond the German question too, the EC played a role in Europe's rapid and largely peaceful transition in the post-Cold War era. The EU, or EC I should say, for that time, became one of the key vehicles for the peaceful transformation in East and Central Europe, though the question of causality is particularly interesting here. The EC did add to this process of stabilizing peace in Europe, but obviously it did not really cause it. The peacefulness of the transformation, which was mainly the work of Eastern Europeans themselves, ultimately gave further support to the EC. In that sense, the European project owes a lot to the bravery of people in places like Gdansk, Prague, and Leipzig. In the end, and as a result of this complex process, the ECU, however, became again the symbolic expression for a new, a peaceful Europe, at least for a certain number of years, so its symbolic and its political roles are again very difficult to separate from each other. Now let's stop the historical assessment of the EU's role regarding peace here, step back and ask what we can learn from it for today. Firstly, later than we tend to think, this is how I would like to summarize the EU's role for peace during the Cold War. Yes, building a peaceful future was one of the motives for integration, but we should also again look at tangible effects. For a long time, the EC hardly contributed to peace in the world. It was rather busy with other much more mundane issues, mostly again in the economic sphere. Today, it sometimes tries to play a role on peace issues, but seen from a historical perspective, 
This is a rather recent phenomenon, and the use results in these initiatives are rather mixed. If you think of ex Yugoslavia in the 1990s, or more recently Ukraine or North Africa. History can therefore teach us that the EU's efforts in this respect are surprisingly recent, and that, you could argue, should teach us humility, but perhaps also a certain quantum of forbearance. Secondly, the EU did contribute to peace, but often in less visible ways than we think, for instance, by helping to create a culture of compromise between the member states, but also by adding to social peace through its covered social policy programs, most importantly, the common agriculture policy. This has caught little attention so far, and these achievements deserve, I think, more recognition. This also contradicts the widely shared view that the peace idea does not work anymore, that it only appealed to the generation that experienced the war and drew the lessons from it. If, however, we focus on effects and less on motives, and if, against this backdrop, we acknowledge that the EU's contribution has always been bigger on issues of social peace than on world peace, the picture really looks very different. So with regard to peace, the EU did not just start to play a role later than we think, but also in other forms. It's a different kind of peace that it created. And this brings me to my third point. Today, I think the EU cannot claim a role comparable to the one it had for France or Germany in the 1960s, later on also for Spain and Portugal, Poland, Slovakia, in contributing again to social peace. Which perspectives does it really offer to the losers of globalization and the digital revolution in our own times? Which tangible forms of support? So at this level, a look back in his, at history is certainly instructive. I fear personally that in future we could pay a rather high price if the EU will not become more meaningful for people and their own worries. This is an issue that would deserve much more space on the EU's agenda, and for this reason, I think it is so sad that so many intellectual and material resources are absorbed by endless Brexit negotiations and other things that ultimately, the grand picture of things, matter, le matter less. Fourthly, this reminds us that ultimately the EU continues to be an economic creature. Its DNA is less defined, I'm sorry to say, by common values rather than by a focus on economic issues. Seeing the world through the lens of economic questions and solutions has shaped the European Union since its inception and continues to do so until today, again, for better and for worse. At the same time, the attitude towards the economic was often quite instrumental. The underlying premise of the post-war years was that overarching political objectives of European integration was really a matter worth spending money on. And that was doable as long as the historically unique post-war economic boom persisted and also the economic effects of integration remained secondary. Even the expansive CAP ultimately represented an annoyance, if you will, but not really a threat to the economic foundations of member states, at least not before the first enlargement round with the United Kingdom entering. The history of the euro since the 1990s offers an example of how dangerous the primacy of the political over the economic can be when questions of real systemic importance come into play. One example would be the risk inclusion of Greece in the euro on the basis of what we now know was dubious statistics, and the repercussions of this were largely then borne by the Greeks themselves. Another would be the general structure def structural deficits of the euro, which created a common currency without a common bank regulation or common political structures. The instrumental tendency in the treatment of economic issues has, I would think, a long history. And in view of the stakes today, it is more dangerous than ever it was during the Cold War. The structural instability of the economic and monetary union has the potential really to lead to a fundamental crisis. The euro is particularly at risk if crisis strikes a large member state like France or Italy. Beyond this, the opportunities and risks of economic and monetary decisions must be brought more consistently and placed more strongly in the center of public interest. Misrepresentations like the Brexit campaign's claims about savings to the national budget would hardly be easy to disseminate if, again, achievements and failures of European integration were presented more transparently 
and discuss more intensely. But we also need to ask ourselves the following two questions. Is prosperity really the best indicator for the success of this integration project, given, for instance, the economic ecological costs? Or also, as another question, how about solidarity in all this, an issue that I touched upon already earlier? Now, fifthly, some of you might wonder why so far, also on the few slides that I had today, I was mainly showing you pictures of elderly men in gray suits. Well, I, I should not say that, but that's what I did. And this points, I think, to another characteristic in the history of the EU. For the longest time, it was a creature of the elites with a strong technocratic dimension. It did not reach people's hearts and minds at large. And this is interesting because in the very first years of that process, during the late 40s and 50s, enthusiasm for the European project was somewhat bigger. At the time, youth activists protested for borderless Europe and demolished barriers along the French, German, and other Western European borders. While over the past few years, we have seen that people have again campaigned passionately, both for again and against the European Union, this has been much less the case for the decades before, when most Europeans simply did not really care much about the European Union. Citizens put up with the technocratic aspects and were happy as long as they were otherwise left in peace. And this attitude towards European integration was rather consumptive than really active. Therefore, also today, I think we should worry about how the European Union can reach people more and be more meaningful for them. To conclude, where do we stand today? Obviously, the European Union is facing serious challenges, both from outside as well as from within. The multilateral liberal parts of the international system are under ever more pressure, as we all know, and so is the European Union. And from within, it is haunted by some of its own construction falls, for instance, again, with regard to the euro, which still we hasn't found, I think, a robust solution. Moreover, I should add, neo-nationalist and sovereignist movements are trying to change the European Union from within, threatening to challenge and erode its core principles and ideas. But I do not want to end on to negative a note with this paper tonight. European integration has made progress, particularly in difficult times. In the 1950s, when the Cold War consolidated, in the 1970s, when the post-war boom was over and established forms of internationalism were challenged, or again in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when the Eastern Bloc first crumbled and then collapsed. It was by no means inevitable that the EC would emerge strengthened from these crises, and yet these phases did turn into opportunities and they were used productively. The European Union has become, I think, astonishingly resilient in the sense that it is in a position to turn externally driven change to its advantage and not just rebuffing it. And this stems less from idealism, if you will, of the participants, than rather from enormous inertia of established institutions, the diverse interests contained within them, but also the general momentum of the integration process and hopefully the support of as many citizens as possible. Architecture, and this is the last thing basically that I want to introduce here, might help us to see this more clearly. Today, we associate the European Union with Brussels and with modern buildings such as the Belle Mont built in the 1960s as the seat of the European Commission. Its modern, its rational, its future-oriented style summarizes a good part of what the European Union is, but only a good part, and not all of it, I would think. The European Union actually reminds me, after more, of this crooked old house, an edifice that reflects its history, with some windows bricked up and new wardens broken through elsewhere, with extensions and conversions, with ruins and follies, which have weathered storms and other crises surprisingly well. Maybe the European house is not very smooth and elegant, but I think it has proved to be surprisingly durable, and it has history and also character. So what does this history teach us at the most general level? It teaches us, I think, how improbable and fragile our own time is that from the perspective of the past, the present is only one of many possible futures and potentially a rather unlikely one. That is the case also for European integration. Rather than proceeding as the implementation of a master plan, the EU that we have today appeared in fits and starts. 
And above all levels of detail, European integration set out to basically make the future much more predictable. It was this hope that shines through all the treaties and directives, the summits and compromises, the plans and proposals. While many saw exactly that as a value in its own right, the idea of Project Euro as an attempt to, if you will, contain the future is less certain again today. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody knows what the future will bring for the European Union and for Europe, but I think one thing is certain. It will depend not least on the conclusions European derive from this history of European integration. Thank you.